side of your life is any hood. For those of you who cannot wait and love daddyhood, please head over to our Patreon. We have exclusive access to episodes. We have early access to episodes and we have behind the scenes footage. Head on over there, sign up, be part of the exclusive daddyhood group and join us over there. Welcome back to daddyhood. As you know, I'm on my path to parenthood. And now that I'm expecting the two guests joining me today, is so fitting. I have so many questions and I need all of the advice. <laughs> Love it. Congratulations, so, by the thank way. You, thank you, thank you. It's yeah. the best awesome. thing ever. Yeah. yeah. So um, welcome to the podcast, Matt and Max, um, the host of Milkless Podcast. Also, I have your bio, so I'm gonna get into it. Matt is a seasoned filmmaker, has directed acclaimed series for Netflix and Hulu, worked with major brands and earned ve- festival acclaims for his films. His screenplay, Alive, hashtag Alive, was a post-COVID box office success and number one on Netflix. He co-hosts Milkless Podcast on fatherhood. He also authored a children's book called Violet Archer. And The Case of the Purple Martian, it debuted in early 2024. Martin. But I Martin. like Martian more. That might be a better book. That's, that's book four. That's look, book four. It's a look, series. I, ha- I, I have it. my strengths and sometimes, you know, <laughs> speech and my, my speech impediments get back. Purple get Martian sounds great. Um, we can work on that together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, He lives in Austin, Texas with his wife and his two daughters. I do. Max is a tech entrepreneur that was on Shark Tank for Morninghead, was a co-founder of Fair Harbor, which grew over 500 employees when he became the CEO. He is a co-host of Milkless Podcast and just illustrated Violet Archer. And you you can illustrate our uh, Martian book too. Uh, The kids chapter book with Matt uh, that Matt wrote. He lives in Park City with his wife and his three kids. He also is the co-founder of the nightly game app and Citizens Cup, a board member of the U.S. Schemo and yeah, sweet. Did I miss a lot of stuff? Great, we're we're into it. We're We're off and running. But most importantly, two amazing dads. Uh, We try working on. We try real hard. Well, then it's going to be fitting that. We like to break everybody in with a dad joke. Right. Don't hit the button because it actually it makes it, a sound. It makes sounds okay. and it's a whole thing with the okay. mics. Um, what's the best kind of music to listen to when fishing? I don't know. I don't know. I'm embarrassed. I have like bass, bass, heavy uh, bass. That's a good one. Heavy bass, but just like anything catchy. Oh, oh boy. boy. You're like, yep. Yep, it's rough. Yeah, appropriately rough. Oh, yep. Have you guys leaned into the dad jokes at all with your kids? Oddly, Do you embarrass two them days yet? ago, I thought it was going to be a dad joke, and I explained what a dad joke was, and I did the one about the tomato. You know the, the ones? No, that, but now that now that you brought it up, let's get into it. Let's hear it. No, I was just like, you know, guys, there's this family of tomatoes, and they're walking in the line, and then, you know, the whole family, and then the one that, in last was kind of lagging a little bit and the dad goes to the back and stomps on the smallest tomato and says catch up (laughs) and that's a good one (laughs) my eight-year-old fucking lost it and i was like no no no, dad jokes are just supposed to be kind of not funny and you're supposed to say oh dad nobody thought it was the most funny thing he'd ever heard this is what people misunderstand about dad jokes we don't tell them because they're good we tell them because our kids like them yeah and then we keep telling them to later embarrass our kids once they become too cool yeah, for us. Totally. Yeah. Metamorphosis. Well, I've been practicing and I feel like I'm going to embarrass mine, which I I sort of think is cool. It's great. It's part, yeah. it's part of the dad, dad thing you're yeah. supposed to do, right? Yeah. The thing I do with my daughter is I tell her that between me and my brother, we know everything. Yeah. And whenever she asks me something I don't know, I'm just like, my brother knows that one. Oh. And that drives her crazy. <laughs> I really enjoy that. Well, I'm, I'm very interested in starting just our discussion with like the balance of being a dad. I think, you know, now that I'm expecting and we're getting into this, I, I mean, I've already learned there's so much pressure and expectations that people put on you and unwarranted and opinions and how you guys have navigated that. What best practices you found? I mean, obviously you guys now have a platform around fatherhood and in fatherhood, you know, what's your opinion sort of on the current state, not only of just like parenting, but being a father too in today's time. Yeah, I mean, I got a quick thing to to dive into. It's just we've said it on our show before, but like I feel like similar to you, I've, I've you know doing some background research. We watched uh, you know some of your Netflix show and you know a lot of the stuff that you've been saying. It seemed like you really want to be a dad, and you've wanted yeah. to your whole life. Same with Matt and myself. Like I, it was something I always knew I wanted to be. Yeah, want to be this great dad. Like 
and so into it. And then all of a sudden we have this baby and I wasn't like super into it at the beginning, but kind of was still into the idea of it. So it was strange. Like I would have the baby on the baby Bjorn and walking around and I'm this guy who's been waiting to do this my whole life. And a lot of the kind of feelings I was imagining, like in the movies, like the minute I become a dad, like it's like unicorns and rainbows. It's like the best thing ever. It was just kind of like a little tough at first. And the things that, you know, you know, we've kind of chatted about that it's kind of hard at first. And then all the people say like, oh, it's the most magical thing that ever happens. That's also true. But that sometimes takes a little bit longer. But we've also heard from other people that they have that feeling right out of the They game. fall in love. Yeah. yeah. So, love at first sight. Yeah. yeah. Something that we've had to kind of talk through is like, how did you reconcile that when, right when you become a dad, something you've always wanted to do. And it's weird to have that cognitive dissonance yeah. where it's like, oh no, I'm yeah. not feeling the things that I've been expecting to feel. And that's a strange feeling. Uh, yeah. At first. Yeah. Am I feeling it wrong? Yeah. You know what we heard, and, and maybe this touches a little bit on what you were, were getting at, is, you know, someone in our life sort of came to us and offered some advice and was essentially like, if you don't fall in love with your baby right away, that's okay. It took me a mm-hmm. minute. And mm-hmm. I think yeah. that is not talked about very often either is like, cause you do put all this pressure in for me. I know like I built it up in my head. Like I can't mm-hmm. wait to be a dad. I can't mm-hmm. wait to be a dad. And then when I, you know, it becomes that time and that baby's in front of me and I don't feel the level of excitement that I thought I was going to, or the emotions that I thought that were going to register to be okay with that too. Mm-hmm. And just mm-hmm. to be more present instead of like having those expectations. But it was just really interesting when I, when I heard someone brought to us and it was like, I didn't bond with my baby for the first like six, eight months. And it really scared me mm-hmm. that like, I, yeah. I was not bonding. I was not like feeling, feeling like I thought I was going to until I sort of removed those expectations is when I started having that connection. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I went through a process too of like reevaluating the way I thought about the connection between love and obligation I remember early on and after my first kid was born, I mean, for the first three months, they're like a blob. If they smile, it's by accident because they farted. You know, it's like all an accident. Um, And I remember having this moment of feeling like, I don't know how emotionally connected I am to this creature as a human being. But I like this thought went through my head of like, would I die for this little girl? And before I'd even finished the thought, I knew the answer was yes. And it's almost like that obligation preceded the love. Mm. And then the love came in. It's very primitive. It's like, I'm a monkey. I had a little monkey. And it is the most important thing to me in the world, how this little monkey's life is. And that kind of came before feeling like a human connection almost. And and the love kind of rushed in to fill that, to to justify that obligation almost, if that makes any sense. but I, I do think that's common that at the beginning, especially when you've really built it up and wanted to be a dad your whole life, you're like, oh, but yeah, I'm sleepy well, and this is a blob. And then right. also a lot of times when you're like a highly successful person in sport, business, whatever, you're just used to kind of doing things pretty good. Right. So when everyone's like, it's going to be really hard, it's like, yeah, maybe for you. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm kind of good at things. <laughs> I got this. If right. you, for example, played in the NFL and then were on television <laughs> and then started a podcast, you might be used to some yeah. level of, yeah. So I was like, you know, my yeah. partner and I, we're pretty like good at shit. So like, <laughs> thanks for and the- And were you uh, good at it? We were like good in, in terms of like, we kept the baby alive. Yeah. But, well, I feel but, like, like that's truly the only, I mean, obviously changing and loving and all of that, but like that is the job for the first six months. Yeah. Keep this creature alive. There's a, Keep them alive and touch yeah. them. As, touch like, them, talk holding. to them. Yeah. yeah do those loving acts and things like that. But like something that I, it's rare that something that, that my partner and I really wanted to do yeah. was not just done. Right. Yeah. Whereas like if I want to start a company, I can just kind of do that and then it will kind of start to happen and then it just kind of happens. Yeah. It's like, oh, I want to have all these magical dad feelings right away and this is going to happen. And then it just kind of, yeah. it's like, wow. And then this is actually really hard. Yeah, And I remember one of the things I tell all people, and I know that you're, you're getting advice overload. This is just more a, a cautionary tale that just like, th- it's okay to, to what your friend said. Like if at the beginning it's like, there's going to come a moment and it usually comes for 
most people where like this is incredibly overwhelming and something that Matt and I talk about on the show a lot is like we don't have the village anymore. Yeah. Whereas humans for a you know, million years had like totally. 50 people living together. So you when you were 16, 17, 18, 20, 25, 30, you would see people parenting young babies all the time. Yeah. So you'd see, oh, the, the difficulties since we're now in these like small nuclear families of like, you know, single family homes, yeah. or isolated. Yeah, you it's don't a weird see, way to do it. And then you there is it comes a moment where you're like, oh, I'm good at things. Right. Why is this so damn hard? Yeah. yeah. What the yeah. fuck is going on? Are we doing it wrong? And then you talk to somebody who has like a four year old and they're like, oh, no, 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 that's normal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just just like, you know, you saying that right up there, I was like, oh, yeah, even since I was a kid, times have changed. Like we had our community and our neighborhood yeah. would go play games outside. And like, you don't see that anymore. You mm. don't see kids on the street. You don't see um, people just out running around. Everybody's at home well, on screens yeah. to a certain degree. And like no judgment there. It's just like, it just shows you how much times have changed already. Just yeah. as far as community and village and, and having that. It's the support system is what it is. Right. And then what yeah. we do see on social media is a lot of people's highlight reel. Yes. And you don't see them on their knees, like crying because, right. you know, they changed yeah. 14 diapers last night. Right. And they got no sleep. Yeah. And it's like sometimes you just need that villager yeah. to tell you, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. It's yeah. normal. Like, I remember having this conversation and I was having it and this mom walked by that I had never met and she just came to join the conversation because she was like, yes. I was like, I remember at the hospital before I took the baby home, all these nurses kept coming up to me and saying like, don't shake the baby. And I was like, what do you think? I'm a monster? Why do you, all these people keep telling me not to shake the baby? And I remember the first time at like 4 a.m. when this baby had just been crying for four hours, I was like, I do see why they tell you. Like, I'm not going to yeah. shake this baby, but I see why so yes, many people yes, yes. walk up to you. And I won't tell say you. that I like understand yet because I don't, but I'm, I, I'm sure. Yeah. That... I like, I get why they told, I get why so, they tell you. Cause, cause this is just something that is somewhat controversial, but like I feel shouldn't be like where we are interviewing night nurses. Mm -hmm. Like, cause mm -hmm. that's just a real thing. Like with, we both work are self-employed and we both work during the day. So it's like, how can we set ourselves up with success? And to your point, is like people used to have support systems and mm -hmm. built-in support systems, whether it was their village and stuff. You know, I already know even within my own inner circle of family and close friends are like, don't do that. You like, you need that bonding time. And I'm like, I also need my sleep. <laughs> and 100%. so it's just, it's interesting. Can, can you talk about a little bit whether you guys, you know, got support or help during in this process at all and or just sort of like the stereotype and narrative around people who sort of like interject themselves not knowing the circumstance in which that person is like building and protecting their family yeah but they're throwing their opinions out yeah it's it's hard i mean i think you have your ideals and then you run into life right yeah. like um we've been pretty crunchy we've done a lot of co-sleeping and a lot of you know we've played musical beds in our house and pretty yeah. much every different combination is slept together at yeah. some point. Um, and I mean, there are, there are parts of that that I really believe in that like physical contact is a big deal, especially for kids before they're verbal, but then like parental mental health is also a pretty big deal. Yeah. Um, and I just don't think once you have kids, it is important to do your research and to have your ideals and your things that you believe in. And, and, uh, I think the more we learn about like brain development, the early part of a child's life, the part that they don't remember is incredibly important, even though yeah. they don't remember it. Yeah. So that stuff is important, but also like you have to make your life work. Yeah. Uh, you just do. Well, in order to be a good dad, you have yeah. to be, you know, you have to set yourself up for success. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. think also position. like you're hitting on something that we've been kind of talking about a lot is this thing of the should. And a lot of times you're going to get advice from people who are, sometimes whether it's good advice or bad are justifying their own decisions yeah. because it's it's a very personal thing and you know if you think about it from the perspective of a parent like the last thing they want to feel is that they did something that could hurt their child mm -hmm. totally. so they're going to whatever they chose usually is is what they're going to tell you yep. whether or not so there's a little bit of it's probably the wrong word but like confirmation bias yeah. in that yeah. type of advice but something that we always kind of say is you got to just drop the shoulds because there's so much should. You should do this. You should get a night nurse. You shouldn't get a night nurse. It's yeah. it's really what you just said. You got to look at it, you, know, you and your partner, figure out what works for you guys, do some research, and then own it. Because you're going to find, if you go down a rabbit hole of like, 
Should you not get a night nurse? Right. There's going to be all kinds of trash in there. Totally. If yeah. you look, should you not co-sleep? Oh, there's going to be all kinds of stuff to make you feel horrible. Yeah. So it's like. You can find stuff to feel horrible <laughs> about whatever decision you make. I mean. And I, I think the other tricky thing is that we have just set up our our culture in a way that is pretty, that makes it really hard on parents. Yeah. I mean, like it. there are all these things that like, Maybe the ideal way to do this or that for a kid of this age right. involves having all four grandparents and seven aunties and 36 kids of ages ranged like one to nine years old, all like in a little village. Yeah. And we got none of that. So we're all kind of trying to piece together what we feel like will be best for our kid mm -hmm. in a society that is not exactly set up to help us with that. So totally. I think that makes it pretty ripe for shame. Yeah. Um, and it like parents are all just kind of like Max said, we our big, everybody's biggest worry is that they're a shitty parent, right? Yeah. It's like, if you, if you care, then you're kind of worried about that. Total. Um, and so I think it, the, the shoulds are, are very hard and are very hard on people. And, and our only should that, and we haven't really written this in stone yet is like have a loving home where yeah. the child feels yeah. worthy of love. And if you nail that, it's like, yeah, everything else falls in place. It'll all work out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And everything else is like, mm, there's some good discourse and discussion that can happen and all these little other choices. Yep. But if you, you just have to nail that. And yeah. And if. I remember I interviewed this dude. Um, we did a, we did this next Netflix series about military veterans. And this guy had been in the Air Force and he was paralyzed from the waist down. But this dude was amazing, man. He was not defeated in his life. He was engaged to be married. He had a house. Yep. He was working. And I interviewed his dad. And his dad had um, mental challenges. Um, and he had grown up, his dad was a single dad. And he had worked uh, as a custodian at a halfway mm. house for um, women who were escaping abusive situations. They'd grown up dirt poor. And I interviewed this guy's dad. And it was a challenging interview just to like communicate back and forth with yeah. him. But the one thing that came through of this interview so clearly is that his dad just loved his son to the moon and back unconditionally and completely. And his kid had turned out great. Yeah. Despite like all that he'd been through, despite using the, uh, losing the use of his legs, just because he always, he never wondered for one second if his dad loved him. Yeah. And it's like, well, the power of love. If you do that, yeah. You prob like you can mess up in a lot of other ways if you do that. Totally. Because if you get into a should situation where let's say that that's like uh, important to you and your partner having you know good sleep and night nurse, cool. But then you, someone shoulds you into co sleeping and getting like total dog shit sleep, and then the baby maybe gets some good benefits from that, but then you're a total asshole. Like it's not enabling us to be the best. And then you're partner. murdering yeah. yourself there. Yeah. Like that's not good. So it's really you and your partner sitting down, chatting, figuring it out. Yep. And then whatever you do is going to be totally so, money. Totally. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about your sort of the inspiration behind Milkless podcast and, and why you thought, you know, why there is a need for it and sort of what ignited in the two of you to like start that and go for it for fatherhood. Yeah, I mean, I remember calling. So Max lived in Amsterdam for a while, uh, and we were really close in college, and we kind of would stay in contact, but not such close contact. But then when he came back stateside, we kind of just started talking about like what is something we could do together that we would both care about and love. Um, and uh, we explored a couple ideas, and then we we started talking about doing a podcast about masculinity. Yeah. But then we were like, we met doing musical theater. Can we really be the voice of <laughs> yes. masculinity? Yeah. Yes, you <laughs> totally. can. Totally. Yeah. Um, but, no, but the more we talked about like the way we would approach a podcast about masculinity, we the more we just kept talking about being dads. Mm. Um, and that that was, for both of us, kind of the most important job we wanted to do well for yeah. the rest of our lives. Yeah. And I I kept feeling like I was having conversations with dads they were the first conversation of its kind that that dad had ever had. Yeah. And it was the first time then been able to say like, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where kind of sheepishly they're like, do you like lose your temper? It's like, we all do. Yeah. Now I didn't know I had a temper until I was a parent. Like you find it. Um, and so I just felt like this is not 
everybody's out there just wondering if they're crazy or yeah. if they're blowing it or if what they're doing is normal or if what they're doing is normal or if yeah. what their kids are doing is normal. I mean, totally. that's another huge one. Like I wish somebody had told me, do that you think it's shame or what's your, your experience so far with, with hosting this and talking to other dads? Like, is it, is it a weird thing of shame? Is it a weird ego thing no, for I think men? It's more that just like the bar was so low or is so low for, for men that, you know, rewinding 50, 70 years. I mean, dads were really not showing up other than possibly financially. Yeah. And so now, you know, you, you're going to have a, a child, you're going to be in CVS, Walgreens, people will come up to you and just be like, you are such a good dad. And it's like, I, I'm just buying something at the pharmacy. Like, are yeah. you babysitting? <laughs> like, no, these are, my or, or, I call it fathering. Oh, no, like, I, was, I was literally at the beach and I threw my kid up in the air and threw, threw him in the water once. You get dad of the year. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I'm not even doing anything. Oh my gosh. So the bar is very low for dads. Also, the, the, it, like, I think moms have a lot of spaces on social media where they're talking kind of real talk. Yeah. This is kind of a new space for dads. To kind of get in here. It's a new generation of dads. Yeah, yeah it is. what is sort yeah. of like, and that was also weirdly the inspiration behind Daddyhood. Similar to you, I think for me more in the fertility journey right mm -hmm. now, because that's, you know, more authentic to my mm -hmm. story. I can't mm -hmm. really yeah. relate to other dads um, yet, but I would talk about m my lack of sperm. And mm -hmm. a lot of men would sort of sheepishly be like, yeah, me too. We, yeah, you know, yeah. we were struggling to get pregnant for two years and we put all the blame on her. And then I got mm -hmm. tested and I was the issue. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, you know, I was like, oh, men don't like to talk about the the fertility because it's sort of like emasculating. That's an ego yeah. thing. And there's a lot of shame around men talking about fertility and their lack of fertility. So that I was just wondering if there was any connection between like the fatherhood thing too of like, am I a good dad? Is this normal? Do you guys yell at your kids? What do you do? Like parenting style wise? Just to see if there was still that ego and that shame that men carry. I, I, I think I, men and women handle it much different. I, yeah, totally. And I, I think that women are better at, I mean, this is a big generalization, but generally better at creating communities of, of mutual yes. support and, yep. and talking about this stuff. I, I do think. Because they're more vulnerable too. That's vulnerable is the. Vulnerability. I, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if it's driven by shame of am I doing a good job. I think it's more like I have been trained for my whole life to not open myself up in that way because being vulnerable in that way is non-masculine and and even like us crunchy kids that are millennials and are supposedly way and i do think we've made a lot of steps i think my dad made a lot of steps from his dad my dad told me he loved me that was a big you know improvement from the generation right. before him but i think we're still walking towards just being able to say to another guy, I have a really hard time with this. Yeah. And I'm scared that I'm like, just saying those words yeah. feels like a really big, just putting yourself out there well, in also, this way that's uncomfortable. It's, it's unclear what the bar is for a dad. Uh, the moms are held to this high standard. Impossibly it, high. Yeah, yeah, possibly high. We say yeah. it sometimes like on the show, like, yeah, moms like, if, if they're doing a 90% good job, horrible mom. Yeah. Dad. 10% failure. 10% yeah. you're just a failure. Like moms are held to a super high standard. Dads, it's kind of like, again, you go to this grocery store with your kid, you're literally celebrated yeah. ticker tape parade. Yeah. Like it's insane. So it's like if, let's say Matt and I believe that we are above average fathers. What do, Should we try to improve? It was kind of like, maybe not shame, but like, I'm good. Yeah. I'm above average yeah. here. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't want to try to improve. So when we started chatting about a lot of this stuff, for example, exploring um, an episode on anger or exploring lying in our kids, our kids are lying to us about stuff that used to make us really upset. And like, you know, they, is it a sign of disrespect from the child? Yeah. But then learning that like, oh, this is just a phase that they're going through where they're actually understanding empathy and that your truth might not be my truth. And like, that's just a way to experiment with whatever. Not to mention like in American society or any society, you need to tell the truth 70% of the time or you go to fucking jail. Yeah. Or 30% and 30 of the time you need to lie to Aunt Peggy that you pretend that you like that gift that she gave you that actually sucks. Right. <laughs> or else you're going to be ostracized in yeah. society. Yeah. So it's like, oh, it's really complex. And exploring that together was interesting. And now... All, a lot of our friends who listen to Milkless will 
reach out and be like, oh, this is a safe now space. Now we get to talk to our friends yeah. about all this stuff. Yeah. It's it become, yeah. that, that was one thing I was going to yeah. say, which has been cool with doing this is like, you know, the more people that I trusted and sort of let in on my journey, the more they opened up on theirs. Mm -hmm. And it just made, you know, friendships even deeper. And also just, just so it's a much different relationship and and deeper conversations that I get to have with my people, Yeah, Yeah. which has been really rewarding and really cool. Yeah. And when people are respond in a good way, it's like they're responding to actually you, Totally. which I'm sure is something that (laughs) you've thought a lot about in your life. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's always sort of been a, a balance. And I think the people closest to me too understand, you know, like, you know, I, I went on a show when I was in my 20, you know, 20s. And there's still lots of me that is and even pre coming out. You know, that, that was a thing, too. It's like I'm I still hold all the, those values. If anything, mm-hmm. that's what kept me in the closet is my desire to want to be a dad for as long as it mm-hmm. did. Mm-hmm. Was I never really saw a pathway for me to become a parent yeah, if I was yeah, gay. Yeah. yeah. Um, until like I came out and met a great community and saw that there's options. So it's just it's, it's so interesting. I think for the two of you, I, I'm interested to know what is how do you keep the balance of being like a cool fun dad but yet also having some sort of structure and and keeping that parental figure Mm -hmm. going on because one thing that i've already seen just with my dogs (laughs) Mm-hmm. I'll try to relate for a yeah. second. Stay with okay. me here with my f- furry friends. It's yeah. not, I had dogs for kids. There's okay, some great, parallels. Right. Okay, I'm uh, glad yeah, that like crazy. I'm not yeah. alone in being like I did really well with my two dogs. <laughs> I think babies. I can. Yeah. I think I can handle a baby. Um, let me just try to relate for a second. Uh, Jordan is definitely more of the uh, disciplinary mm-hmm. parent. Mm-hmm. So like, if something happens mm-hmm. in the house that shouldn't happen in the house, he's the one, and he's sort of got on me a little bit of being like. Mm-hmm. I need you to step up and being mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. the discipline. I can't always be the bad guy mm-hmm. and I'm not good at that. I don't like, I really don't like confrontation and I don't really mm-hmm. like being the bad guy. So how do you guys balance that of like being fun and cool and relatable with your kids, but also just being firm? Yeah. I mean, so we did like a lot of research going into our consequences episode about like there, the, all the data shows that like, just to simplify it, there's like some oversimplification, there's three types of parents. There's permissive, where anything goes. There's the other extreme, authoritarian, mm-hmm. where it's my way or the highway, totalitarian government type thing. But the ideal with the best outcomes is authoritative in the middle here, where there are very clear boundaries, Yeah. but then love and nurture and like support and, and actual discourse and discussion yeah. about these rules. Yep. They can challenge them. You can talk about them. But th- th- you have to hold those boundaries. So the way kind of I try to do it, is we have those boundaries. What are those those things that, that is a line that cannot be crossed? Like throwing food across the table when they're old enough to, to not throw food across the table. Yeah, yeah. That's something that is just not going to fly. Um, and then learning how to kind of deal with those sort of sorts of consequences in a, like a relatively calm manner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as calm as possible. As calm as possible. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, so it's just... Nobody bats But then you're, you're like the cool dad. Everything's fun. Yeah. It's, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then if it's like, can we have a mud party inside? It's like, no. no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, come on, dad. You're the fun dad. It's like, yeah. just no. Yeah. Like, yeah. no. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, I do, when you see, I the, to me, one of the most important things is to teach my kids. And the other thing about thinking about like the idea of discipline, I think a lot about like discipline, the the etymology of that word is disciple. It's about yeah. teaching. Yeah. It's not about punishment. It's about like them learning how to be a person that treats other people. And so I think a lot of the most important like discipline work that I do is around like tr- the way you treat other people. Right. And so I've never wanted your kids will occasionally just treat you like shit just because they don't know or because they're all in or they, you know, they really only kind of see things from their perspective. Yep. And so it was never hard for me to be like, okay, this is a moment, like I'm, I can't just like let her treat her sister that way or let her treat the dog that way or let her treat me that way. I think the tricky thing for me has always been, and I think I see a lot of dads run into this because a lot of dads are, there's a connection between dad, fatherhood and play that you see frequently. Yep. I mean, again, I'm speaking in generalities, but you do see a lot of that. And so what I've always worried about is going from, like you said, the fun guy to like suddenly a line is crossed and suddenly I'm the scary guy. Yeah. And I've tried to create a pattern so that that transition isn't just like that. Yeah. So that it's like, 
we're they having see fun. the steps yeah. that it takes for yeah. you to get to that. Exactly. So it's not just like yeah. a, a switch. Of, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll even start if we're having a good time and some, I feel like across the line, I'll start with humor. So I'm like, oh, you was, know. That was my next question is yeah. how you guys, like, how do you interject humor into your disciplinary and does that work? Is it effective? It has been effective for me as a waypoint between the good time and the pissed off time. Yeah. Is like. I, lo I love that you, you sort of, you identify that you wanted to have a, a, like a, a, a progression. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah. I, I actually think that's healthy too. And it's, it's healthy for the kid. Out of nowhere is scary for kids. Like the unpredictability yeah. of like a sudden explosion, I think. That's what it's, that, fun. it's not fun for anybody. It's not. Yeah. It's fun for no yeah. one. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And for kids, I think that's how like they end up being on their toes a little bit if yeah. they feel like they're not going to see it coming. So yeah, it, creating that progression has been important for me. Yeah, We even pulled a study just about like parents who are like hard on their kids and always on them that kids who had parents who are overly critical. Yeah. Like the kids actually avoid looking at faces in general. Wow. So it's like, <laughs> that's terrifying. It's yeah. horrifying in general, how much power you have as a parent. It, yeah. Like I'm consistently like, oh my gosh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like they just watch you so close, you know? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. What has your favorite age been of being a dad? I mean, I'm other than that, like now, but it's just, has it been different? Has it been, have you found like a, you were like, oh, I really enjoyed this moment the most so far. I my like, I feel like. I know that's probably an impossible question to answer. But. I've never had like a. F it'll be like this four months was awesome. And then this yeah. two months was tricky. And then this three yeah. months was amazing. And usually Max said this funny thing. I, uh, one time on our podcast, he's like, I always think the kids are happening to me, but really we're happening to the kids. Yeah. Usually when we go through a rough stretch, I go back and look and my work was stressful and yeah, I yeah, was yeah. as much responsible for that dynamic totally. as whatever developmental phase the kid was in. I've generally, I have a six year old and one and a half year old. I like, it's f the more I can talk to them, the more I can play imagination games, the more like I feel like we can play. That's yeah. really fun. Yeah. But my 18 month old will just give me a full body hug. Mm. They like, they are so raw. Toddlers are so raw. It's also the thing that makes them just like smack you in the face yep. when they're mad, which can really make your blood boil, but they will just, they're like all just raw emotion. Yeah. And the good side of that is like, unbelievable right so I, I think it'd be hard for me to say i'm curious what you would say yeah we have a four six and eight year old i'd say like i'm not a huge fan of like under one um that's a lot of just like taking care of a baby and like you after the first three months it gets a little easier first four months and then you're like okay this is like a really fun baby but then like at six months it's way more fun than four months and then it's like for me and then at eight months i'm like oh my gosh way better than the six yeah. and it just keeps like almost doubling in funness better. and then i'm like a sucker for progress like when the kids start saying stuff and then you can kind of point to things like where's the window and then they can mm -hmm. point to the window and then that progression of language for me is like yeah so fun and then matt said a really good thing on one of our social pieces like that you know kids understand things way earlier than they can say them right also, just the importance of talking to kids in language that is more advanced than they are. Um, yeah, yeah. Baby talk's great for like yeah. a two-month-old, but eventually you start talking more complex because then you can talk to like kids about super complex shit when they're like four years old. Yeah. Like really complex stuff. See, that that's what seems fun for me. Yeah, yeah. It's like once you could sort of get into that that moment where you could still have your, you know, be a parental figure to them, but also teaching them and yeah. interacting yeah, with them. yeah. 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 Um, it's great. It's great. I, my, I think that were it not for my wife, I think that a lot of the baby phase would have been a little boring for me. Yeah. She comes from a, she's a therapist. She's done a lot of like research into early childhood development. And yep. I think through what she knows, I've been able to see the, like, just kind of the wonder on yeah. like a seven month old's face totally. when they just like look at the world and realizing like, Oh man, there's something like transcendent happening in their brain. Yep. Just watching little kids and the, and the amount of just like touch and physical contact and like little bit, they like feel good. They're yeah. like, you know, pump and you know, um, so 
But I'm with you. I mean, when I started getting my six year old into like black holes and we were just watching science videos and black oh. holes, I'm like, this is dope. We're just nerding it's out so, together. Sci fi yeah. is our genre, Jordan and I's genre for all TVs. We talk about three body problem all the time. Oh, I got yeah. Max Reed. So I'm good. In, yeah. I'm in the, I'm in you guys read the books too and watched the show? Yeah, I read I'm, the books first and then watched the show. I'm in the, the third book right now. Okay. So you haven't watched the show, right? Because no. you're waiting on it. Either. The books, the, uh, Jordan read all the books mm-hmm. and it's a little, it was a little, um, tough for me to keep up with the names <laughs> yeah, in the yeah, books. Yeah. So the show made that much easier. Yeah. 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 yeah Have yeah. you, um, uh, oh gosh, is it called the Hail Mary project? And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, Oh, the one where they launched the guy into space. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Or yeah, just the guy's I just butchered the, the name of it. Yeah. I'll have to get with Jordan. Cause he said that that's his all he reads. He's read that one multiple times now. Oh wow. It was so yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. Sci- yeah, sci-fi. Sorry, getting off track. So, on no, the sci-fi. it's great. Yeah, and kids in like that. I don't really know how a black hole works, but I like my six-year-old could get in. But it's also it. fun, probably learning with the kids. Totally, it's awesome. I know so much about animals Look, now and dinosaurs. There's a silver lining in not being the most educated person <laughs> as far as like book smart. <laughs> yeah. Is I, I can't wait to learn with my yeah. kids. Oh, yeah, so, so fun. Because like I, there's still a lot that I can learn, and I'm totally. I'm sort of excited about that. So it's great. Yeah, enough said on on the lack of, of book yeah. smart for me. But um, I just started reading again. I had read in twenty years. It was, um, I was I, I've never read in my life. Yeah, um, now you get to, and you get to start with books that I are listen really to audio books on on cassette during. <laughs> I kid you not. We had like reading class, and you'd have to take the quizzes. I I just for whatever reason. I mean, you saw it in the in the bios. I had like slight dyslexia, oh, yeah, and then yeah. also like. I would read fast enough if I didn't really know the word, I would just say it. Uh-huh. And it's like, mm-hmm. it's made up word, but it's just yeah. like, it helped my brain continue without getting caught there. Mm-hmm. And I love going on little tangents, yeah. but um, I found what worked for me and the cassettes tape and being, you know, having that audio. But like, that's what I want to be as a dad. Like my kids and human beings are all unique. They're all individual. They're all going to have their own set of whatever you want to call it. Individuality, problems, concerns, mm-hmm. like but that's for us to tackle as a family unit. That's yeah. what's exciting yeah. to me. Yeah. It's like, I feel like if everybody's story was the same and everybody was supposed to be the same person, our lives and just this planet would be so boring. Yeah. So we need different people out here. Yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. Know, I, I, it's sort of, it's hundred percent. When it you break it down, it's you're like, that should make sense to everybody. Yeah. We yeah. shouldn't all be the same. No. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And then just the excitement of like seeing who your kid becomes and seeing yeah. and the, and it's funny there's part you how, know, how old are your kids so six and then about one and a half six, six and, and a half one and a half okay do you like that age gap uh it was not uh we we share your ivfness um okay. and we have science babies and uh covid happened in the middle so it was not like a calculated five-year age gap yep. um it's been great because m- if if like my six year old can be is a net is net helpful with the one and a half year old. Got it. Whereas Got if it. she were two, she would probably be the biggest danger to yes. the yes. <laughs> you know. Um, so it's been good so far. I okay. think you know I've talked to people with varying different age gaps. I think there's pluses. And we're minuses we're in that conversation now. I'm pushing for eighteen months, but we'll see. Oh yeah, you want to go bang bang? I think so. We That's, had to make a decision with twins too, and we opted out of it just because we wanted to bond. What's sort yeah, what's my, your age? My take: ours is they're all about two years apart. One is 20, like 20, twenty-two months, and one's two and a half years. Yeah, love it. I mean, I guess the the the, the pitch for because I'm justifying my position. That's what parents do. Yeah, yeah, Come yeah. on, my way is the only <laughs> way. Justifying my, my way is the only way. My 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 brother is eighteen months, and I just thought that was a perfect like we had built-in friend groups. We yeah, we crossover. Yeah, yeah. We're still close. Like. I just thought it was the, good. The, yeah, it, it's great. I mean, like our the six and eight year olds could literally play for twelve hours straight. Yeah, like and yeah. with that said, when yeah. when the youngest was crawling and the oldest was two, crawly baby grabs the toys of the two year old. Yes. Two year old doesn't have enough empathy yet. Yep. Like karate chop, and you know, there's like yeah. two cats in, in an alleyway like it's what's, what's dr becky said emotional regulation yeah he doesn't yeah. know how to regulate his yeah emotions. doesn't know how to regulate so you know there's some toughness in there and i remember yeah. at that point feeling like oh, we've made a terrible mistake <laughs> <laughs> that was only two two months that we then, were talking before the mics were on the most terrible the te- a terrible mistake but also the best and most beautiful thing you're ever gonna do yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but like it's just getting Both through that you know what you know what i've never said this yeah. like on air before but like something that is making me think of this so after selling the software company, I 
did a stint of trying to make the U.S. Olympic team for USA Schemo. Yeah. So I was training full time, 40 hours a week for... Can you break down Schemo for me? Schemo is uh, basically uphill and downhill skiing where okay. you run up the mountain rip the skins off underneath your, your skis and then and ski down. down through gates. So you run up with skins on the bottom of your yes, skis. Yes, which yeah. takes okay. about 90% of the time. So it's really a beast of a cardio sort of thing. Yeah. And I was training for the sprint, which was a four-minute race. So it's like you basically run up to the torch of the uh, Statue of Liberty and, just fly down. and then just ski down really fast. Wow. The whole thing takes three and a half, four minutes. And let me say this because you won't, but I feel like it legitimizes the whole endeavor. He was the 12th fastest in the nation Yeah, at, at this. So it wasn't uh, like a total training. foolhardy, yeah, my, like my other, insane pursuit. Uh, Instagram is like dad bod goes pro. Um, I stopped that because milkless just takes so, so much time. <laughs> so now I'm pro goes dad bod. I'm in a growth phase. Got it, got it, got yeah, it. I love um, that for you. <laughs> <laughs> but so... Uh, but during that training, my coach said, because I was all into like wanting results. Yeah. And it reminds me of the kid a little bit, like having their first kid. I was like, where's all this feeling that I've been waiting for my whole life to be this mm -hmm. thing? What he said about the training was he's like, dude, have a goal, make a plan, yeah, forget the goal, and just do the thing. Now, with that said, what I'm saying is that if my goal was to have those feelings and maybe consulting some people, they say, you will feel those when the kid is four, if you want to, or eight, if you want to ski mm -hmm. powder with your eight-year-old son. You yeah. will feel that when he's eight. So make a plan to get there. Make sure you tick some boxes, you know, of X, Y, and Z. And then just like, let that go a little bit. You know, yeah. you don't need to feel those things. And then for my wife and I, like, strap the baby on and go to a beer garden. Excellent. Like, yeah. let's go to a concert. Put earplugs in amazing let's go on a hike and have a snack at the top so fun like and then the life became just like strapping on the baby yeah. kind of almost hibernate through to a future not being like totally not in touch with my child but like it was okay that we weren't feeling the things yeah yeah and, or i wasn't and but then it started coming after, after three four months five yeah. months yeah and then it just grew. It just continues to grow. Beautiful. Yeah, I think I think the holding and the caring is almost as big for the parents as it is for the kid too. We're like, uh, there's different kinds of, and I'm gonna get it wrong, but there's like, there's cash mammals or cash animals, and those are the animals that hide their babies so they can go find food. Yep. And, and then there's like a couple, of, and then there's the babies that just like pop out, and like 20 minutes later they can run from predators. Yeah. We're the opposite of that. Our babies are useless. We're carry mammals. I was just We're talking. Supposed it to was carry. so funny. I was actually just talking to my brother about this, and he goes, "You never really think of it, but until you have a baby, every other animal in our animal kingdom, the babies, you know, with exceptions, can basically take care of themselves, and they're like good to go." We, if we left our baby for more than 48 hours, it would be dead That's it. in an yeah. instant. Yeah. But every yeah. other animal sort of, you know, ducklings and uh, all the other animals for yeah. the most part could survive on their own. I mean, of course there's predators and stuff out there and dangers, but like they would be able to somewhat take care of themselves. Yeah. With the exception of probably baby birds up in a yeah. nest. And, and those fed. are cash animals. Right. So they, so they hide example. them and then they, yeah. But, and... And what, what we get in return for that is this like amazing ability of our brains to adapt and change to our environment. Like totally. the neuroplasticity of humans is unparalleled by any other yes, creature. Yes, yes. And the payment for that is that we're useless for a long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we really, really need we really need our caretakers really badly. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Um what advice do you have for other dads out there? I mean, obviously, like you guys have been super helpful for me just in, in this journey. Um, I mean, I got something just for, for dads, um, parents, just make sure that you have a good communication with your partner. Um, we talked about it a lot in our early episodes, like having that feedback loop at least, let's say, once a week or something where you check in. Do you have a system? With not, your not really, but just like if it's strange we're vo both very good at life. And <laughs> Thank just, you for saying that. Yeah, just, but then when you have the kids, it's like you will have disagreements with your yeah. partner about discipline or food yep. or bedtimes or whatever. And if you just kind of acquiesce and not have that, you will develop resentment. Yeah. Um, if one is doing more work than the other and they don't talk about it, it's like, well, okay, whatever, yeah. fuck you. You know, like it, 
having that feedback loop. And then let's say there's a story that I talk about where I hit the table and like screamed at the kids one time and felt horrible about it. My wife and I talked about it after. Hey, listen, yeah, how'd that go? Man, what did I do out there? Yeah, what could we have done different? Yep. That sort of feedback loop yeah. is so important about everything. Totally. Like, oh my God, like, how are you doing? Because a lot of times, sometimes there's a weird there's a weird thing we've talked about. Like, as long as both people are like open and kind of struggling, then yeah. it's like, oh, you're kind of miserable too? Yeah. Great. Oh, I you're will. exhausted? Oh, that's fantastic. Otherwise, if you yeah. think you're the only one suffering yeah. and then you, you know, take it out on your partner, that's not good for anybody. And then also talking with your partner about those shoulds because like i remember we were like everyone said you should change the diaper you know in the middle of the night right when you wake up I'll wake up a you know baby woke up has a poopy diaper oh we gotta change that diaper then feed it it's shit again <laughs> change the diaper again in, in in a single cycle and if the baby's waking up two hours every two hours we wake up and there'd be like 20 diapers <laughs> sitting there. in the morning and yeah. it's like this is not sustainable you know, like without talking about that, it's like you just end up like doing a lot of self-inflicted damage. Totally. Yeah. And you're very aware of all the hardships you're experiencing, but you miss a lot of the ones that your partner is experiencing. That's, and so that yeah. can breed that resentment. Totally. And if you just talk about it, you're like, it's, oh, you're struggling too. Yeah. That was one thing. One thing Jordan and I are good at is our communication, just in the fact of we're really good at sort of saying, I don't have a, a strong opinion about this. So what, like we sort of are good at defaulting and mm -hmm. just saying like, mm -hmm. if it's important to you, I will do it this way. Or yeah. if it's important to you, I will do it that way. Yeah. And that's sort of how we felt is just, it really works. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I, he is already researching formula. Like what formula, like why certain oils and certain things he doesn't want in it. I really, I mean, I, I don't know. For, I grew up in Illinois and, on cornbread and corn and soybeans. So I'm like, what? Turned out okay. <laughs> Turned out fine. So like, I don't have strong opinions, but I'm like, yeah. if you want that, I will, let's do this. Let's but do it. Also though. checking in on general workload, mental load. We did an episode on like spousal scorekeeping and just whether we thought we were 50, 50, um, it will, it will teeter and totter. Yeah. When one is doing more, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. but maybe Jordan's researchy stuff might start taking up a lot more of his mental load yeah. and then he feels alone in that sort right. of thing and right. even just talking about that sort of thing how are we doing how's everybody feeling because it's it's going to be the yeah. most intense thing that's ever happened totally so it's like i feel like sure we got a good test run with our wedding you know mm -hmm. i sort of let him yeah it's yeah. like oh it's really important to yeah. you to have this this way and you like you do your thing i'll help support mm -hmm. he did a lot of the research mm-hmm yeah, I just supported how I, you know, how I support. Yeah, yeah. but 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 acknowledging that that mental load is, is like an invisible work and an invisible burden that somebody yeah. is, and and there are multiple mental loads. There's the who thinks about money stuff, or do you yeah. think about that together? Who knows what's in the pantry? Who knows when the last time the pediatrician, whatever? These are yeah. all kind of like. And they're, they're harder to see than like the laundry For or the sure. dishes, but For they sure. are like still weights that somebody is carrying that I think are yeah. worth saying out loud yeah. because it is, uh, it's, it is amazing how much it changes your relationship with your partner. It yeah. just also does. like, it, even if like yeah. if Jordan's the one planning the going to the apple orchard, yeah, then it's like. It's like there could develop some resentment like, Colton, why are you never planning our weekend things? Yeah. You know, I've like, never planned a damn thing in my life. Yeah. <laughs> like, so those sorts of things, which I've never really thought of, are are important. And, and it, like a, a study to kind of round us out here was like there was a study that said that actual equity in the division of labor between partners like does not matter for it does not track with like higher or lower incidence rates of depression or whatever. Mm -hmm. A perception of equity is is what's important. Does it feel fair? Does it feel more fair? than if it is fair? Yeah, is that both in in uh, personal relationships and professional, or just personal? This I study wonder. was on on was parents. On, I'm, I'm interested yeah. to know if like even with like co CEOs, you know, like it, yeah, yeah, I think it's it's, it's it's like oh, you're good at this yeah. and I'm good at this, and yeah. you're better than me at that, and I'm better than you. So and I'll you hate that, doing this, and I don't mind. Right, right, right. yeah. Someone from the yeah, outside yeah. might say, wait. This person does all the laundry and all the grocery shopping, and this person does all this. Yeah, but but then maybe that person values the, what the other person does ten x what exactly. they exactly. Because for example, like we talked about it, like I get up with the kids 
because even after night nurse and after that, you're going to have like a, a child who has nightmares wakes right. up. Who's right. the one that wakes up right. and goes and kind of comforts a child or yeah, puts totally. him back to sleep? And it's like, oh, I, I've always done that after the kid was one year old. For sure. And I was like, I never really chalked that up to Matt was saying, you know, there's a checklist you can do, which I think is a great way to. Yeah, my wife found this checklist about like. And she filled it out without telling me. I was like, oh my gosh, this seems like... So you got to see exactly everything she did. She never showed it to me. She just okay. she didn't tell me until much later she'd done this. And she was like, we're actually pretty good. And I was like, oh, thank God. Because <laughs> um, she probably values some things that you do that you were right. like, oh, I'm barely even trying here. But yeah, like, yeah, so yeah. This she, is why it doesn't come down to the should. partnership. Some outsider might say, oh, totally. I can't believe that you do all this or Jordan does all yeah. that. It's like, are you too cool with it? Yeah. yeah. Then, as long as then it works cool. for you, we're good. good. Yeah. 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 Do you have any advice? Yeah. Uh, so I, it's funny cause you go on Instagram or wherever and you get a ton of advice about what you should do. Um, and then there's a lot of prescriptive advice too. Like if your kid says this, then what you say is this. See, I can't do that. I was like, my kids are going to I'm no, a robot. I'm, I'm throwing a, out yeah. all of the books as soon as yeah. the baby's yeah. here. And it's just um, like, but one of the favorite, one of my favorite things somebody told me and it doesn't make things easier, but they said, your, your kids don't really listen to you. They watch you. You can do everything possible to tell your kid that perfection is not a goal to shoot for. But if you are a perfectionist, your kid will see that Yeah, because they're watching you. I have unresolved bullshit I didn't even know about. Yeah. And it when you have kids, you find it. Yep. We all do. I mean, nobody comes out of childhood unscathed, right? Like right. even, and I had great parents. I was very lucky. I yep. like grew up in a very, very lucky way. I don't mean that. But I think that some of my most important work that I've done as a parent is figuring out what my hangups are so that I know what I am bringing into an interaction with my kid. Mm. Because I think my biggest parenting failures and the failure rate is especially for like a high achieving kind of person the failure rate is kind of startlingly high i yeah. screw up something every day yeah it's embarrassing yep. um but i feel like those mistakes are seldom because i didn't know what i should do right those mistakes are because of who i am yeah uh and man i've started doing stuff i never thought i would do in my whole life i do yoga now just to calm the fuck down yeah. so I can be a better dad. You got to find what works for you. You yeah. got to find what works for yeah. you. And so there is a piece of parenting that I really think is earnestly opening up oh, your I little box of bullshit yeah. and trying to sift through it so you don't just hand it straight. Because if you don't totally. sift through it, you just hand it to your children. Yeah. Um, no matter what you say to them. That's such a good point. Gosh. It sucks though, because that's like the heart. That's like the it hardest. It, <laughs> it does, like, yeah. And I mean, it, it just brings up such. Good, I mean, you. I mean, it's just it's it's sort of cool though that you two have put so much work into into the fatherhood thing, because that's that's somewhat what I feel like. You know, I've been educating myself a lot on fertility, but now it's time to sort of like step up. And I feel like everything in my life, it's like sort of tested. by you just got to you have to do it. Yeah, I have yeah, to be yeah. thrown into the fire. Yep. I, there is, yeah. I I'm not. You can prepare all you want, but as soon as like, you know, you're in it, like to, to your point of training for, for skiing, I think like the beauty of like, even my football career mm -hmm. was like, I hold so much more value into my training, into my process to even make it to the mm -hmm. NFL mm -hmm. on practice mm -hmm. squads versus like actually being there. Uh -huh. like my memories of like earning that yeah. are so much better now yeah. than like the actual moment that I was there. Yeah. So it's just like if you have that perspective. Yeah. But yeah, so. you got to get in there. What we talk about, we joke about one of our favorite parenting quotes is a Mike Tyson quote. Yeah. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Exactly. You get punched in the face a ton. As soon as that baby's yeah. here, that punch is <laughs> yeah, coming. It's coming. You get ready. Yeah. And when they get the right height, yeah. it's a punch in the nuts, actually. <laughs> <laughs> just will happen. It's oh. shocking how often you get racked as a parent. Well, just, just like uh, thinking back to memories of like screaming like in a baby's face. Yeah. Like, why would you yell at a what baby? What kind of monster yells at a baby? <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. And then you like, hear that and it's yeah. like, and it's like, oh, well, I that did, monster. I did yeah. yell at a baby. Yeah. Yeah. I yelled a at a times. baby one time. <laughs> what well, do you want from me? What, what do you want right now? 
for more on yelling from babies. <laughs> um, no, I'm excited because this is a part two and or a two parter, and we're gonna now transfer over to the Milkless podcast. So for everybody who's enjoyed this conversation, oh man, yeah, all right, here we go. Let's yeah. head let's head on over and go search the episode Into on Milkless. Here we go. Here yeah. we go. The ride of your life is steady hood. 